just look out your window the people on the streets the houses the traffic the market it's all driven by demography demography undergirds changing patterns of supply and demand from work to recreation nothing happens without demography demography affects every aspect of our lives it's the foundation of economics in all countries and it helps account for the rise of china why are we here talking about China today, why is there so much both admiration and concern for China and for what it's achieved in the last 30 years? It's because it's the world's largest population. Population has played a positive rather than a negative role in promoting China's economic growth. During the reform and opening up period, when China embraced a market economy and integrated into the global economic system, the rapid population change has created a sound demographic structure. Why does the U.S. consider China to be its strategic competitor, even its arch rival? It's complex, of course, various reasons, but underlying many of them is China's huge population. China has four times as many people as does the U.S. China's a big country. It's the other reason, of course, why we've always paid such attention to it. A billion people is a number um, that is shocking, that takes you a, a long time to get your head around. Can you imagine China with a population of under 150 million like Russia? The size of Russia is 1.6 to 1.7 times that of China. Its population, though, is just over one-tenth of China's. So can Russia compete with China in terms of the economy? The economic scale of Guangdong province alone may surpass that of Russia. Russia's strength is more reliant on its military capabilities inherited from the Soviet Union and its rich natural resources. In terms of high-tech, industrial, manufacturing, and value chain, Russia is hardly competitive. But can you imagine Russia with a population of over one billion people? It would be a radically different country. Судьба России и ее историческая перспектива зависит от того, сколько нас будет. Not long ago, in his State of the Nation address, President Putin said that the future of Russia lies in its demography. Demography is a fundamental proposition for a nation, a community, a culture, a civilization. Demography is destiny. This is a milestone announcement. China has confirmed that its population on the mainland at the end of 2019 had crossed 1.4 billion, without doubt the world's most populous country. But no one has ever imagined this country with such a large population base is about to face a least expected fact, the looming population shrinkage. The conventional wisdom that China, the world's most populous country, has state publication slogans now exhort couples to have children. China has entered a long-term downward population. China's population is aging more rapidly than it is getting rich. The era of negative population growth is almost... That could stoke economic troubles that far outlast... If China's, China's demography will determine China's future. birth rate fell to its lowest... It's marked consecutive declines in the country. China's population has begun to decline and is rapidly aging. There's a looming it's crisis. In China, and it could eventually have a seismic effect. In the worst case, it risks an empty... Decades ago, China saw a pretty high population growth rate when births peaked at 25 per thousand. Today, births are only around 5 per thousand, slightly over one-fifth of the peak period. It's a remarkable change. Back then, the mushrooming Chinese population was a significant feature. But today, the growth is declining at an accelerating pace. Some may think, why should China worry about a shrinking population? After all, 1.4 billion Chinese constitute the world's largest population and standards of living are rising. To see the problem, however, it should be viewed from a broader perspective.
A major problem for China's population is the declining fertility rate. It's common for people living in more developed regions to also be reluctant to have children. But notably in China, in the coming decade, the number of females aged between 22 and 35, a woman's peak reproductive years, is set to drop by over 30 percent. That is, the number of potential mothers will continue to decline. Additionally, China's fertility rate today is roughly half the global average. These two factors combined will mean Chinese newborns account for less than 5 percent of the global total in one to two generations' time and it won't end at 5 percent. To maintain a stable percentage, our fertility rate must meet the global average. But if it takes China two to three generations to raise its fertility rate to the world average, by then Chinese newborns may only account for two or three percent of the global total. Two centuries ago, a third of the global population was Chinese. Two centuries from now, a mere three percent may be Chinese. Such a shift is alarming. China's economy needs sustainable, high-quality growth. Energy-efficient, low-pollution, technology-driven, and sustainable, high-quality growth requires economies of scale, which in turn requires a sustainable population. And if a replacement level of fertility is not achieved, and if the population begins to decline, as now predicted as inevitable, how then can China realize high quality growth? A declining population portends market contraction. Also, the bad news is Chinese people's willingness to have children is among the lowest in the global community. According to research, people in Japan and the Republic of Korea generally want to have two or more children, while in China, even including the rural areas, on average want 1.9 children, which is lower than in other countries and regions in East Asia. So a key question, what is causing China's declining fertility rate? Why are Chinese people choosing to have fewer children? Uh, the most obvious of these is economic development. There's a kind of circular um, dependency between higher economic growth and, and lower fertility rates. That aside, the education level of women has the most direct impact on the fertility rate. As women become better educated, the fertility rate is set on a downward course. It's a common global phenomenon. Second, participation in the labor force, especially by women, dramatically weakens their role as the family's primary child rearer. China happens to now be the world's leader in terms of female participation rate in the labor force. People struggle to balance life and work. They may hardly have time to care for a child. Young parents tend to turn to the grandparents for help as urbanization gathers momentum. Rural residents who worked in the fields had enough time to raise two or three children, but now a majority of people are salary earners with little time to bring up offspring, and a shortage of nursery schools makes the situation worse. Improvements in health care also extend or reduce the chances of, of childhood mortality and so um, families also need to have fewer children uh, in order to ensure that they've got children to look after them when they're old. Interestingly, when people bear fewer children, the cost and pressure of raising them becomes in fact increasingly higher. People tend to adopt different parenting models when they have different numbers of children. Those with one kid will devote all the family's resources and energy to that single child who carries the future of the whole family. The fewer the kids they're raising, the more devoted the parents would be. Single child parents spend lavishly on extracurricular lessons, but if parents have two or three children, they're less likely to do so. A single child that bears all the hopes of a family, on the other hand, imposes daunting pressure on the parents to make sure that he or she doesn't lose out at the starting line. It explains why a low fertility rate engenders a vicious circle. The fewer children people have, the higher the pressure in raising them, which makes people more reluctant to have children, which results in fertility rates that trend lower. So there are lots of natural reasons why fertility rates come down and the demographic story, the demographic dividend follows. But there's no question that the one-child policy took this you know, to a, to a higher level. 
Over the past decades, China's family planning policies have undergone continuous change. See the historical data in People's Daily. In 1957, four years after the first national census, new population theory authored by Ma in Chu, a prominent demographer and president of Peking University, called for controlling the size and improving the quality of the population. At the start of the 1970s, the emphasis was on family planning. The slogan at the time, one child isn't too few, two are just fine, and three are too many. In 1978, Article 53 of the Constitution states, the state promotes family planning. For the first time, family planning was included in China's Constitution. A year later, all couples were asked to raise one child, two at most. In 1980, leadership stressed taking resolute measures to control population growth, except in scarcely populated ethnic minority regions. The CPC Central Committee reaffirmed that a couple should only have one child, marking the official enforcement of China's one-child policy. In 1982, at the 12th CPC National Congress, family planning was made national policy. Until 1984, there was a small allowance for rural areas where women could have a second child after approval, especially those whose first child was a daughter, but out of quota pregnancies were strictly forbidden. Entering the 21st century, the strictly enforced family planning policy was relaxed progressively. From 2002, couples who were both an only child were allowed to have two children. From 2013, couples where just one of whom was an only child could have a second child. And from 2015, a universal two-child policy was rolled out. Today, the one-child policy no longer holds as family planning policies have been liberalized increasingly. Uh, from the 1950s, 1960s onwards, there were a lot of Western development economists talking up the benefits of slower population growth. And there was quite a push uh, from the West to try and bring population growth rates, fertility rates down, not just in China, but in India, across Africa and most of the developing world. At the time, China was financially challenged by multiple socioeconomic issues. I can say the economic issues were more serious. How to feed a population of close to one billion? It was a priority for the government and policymakers to consider. With a relatively high rate of population growth, we saw acute tension between population growth and socioeconomic development. Many people believe that a population growing at such an exceedingly fast pace represented a burden on economic and social development, as well as on resources and the environment. China, as it is wont to do, took this to its own special level uh, with Deng Xiaoping in 1980, basically announcing that he wanted to quadruple per capita income growth by 2000, by which point he would also bring population growth to zero. In confronting the explosive population growth that was putting such heavy pressure on resources and the environment during that period, it seemed plausible to limit the number of children women were allowed to bear. But reflecting back to the early days of the one-child policy, given the economic and social conditions at the time, many couples wanted to have more children. Many wanted four children, but they were forcibly restricted to one. The policy set a limit on the number. The family planning campaign was technically voluntary, but it involved a number of coercive elements, including practices that crossed a line, like forced abortion and sterilization. This strict policy generated huge social contradictions, as they say. To stop zealot-like abuses, authorities issued various decrees. Yes, it should be noted that during the implementation, the government issued several decrees which included prohibiting seven specific practices, namely illegal detention, beatings, destruction or seizure of property, levying excessive fines, punishing the couple's family and friends, preventing legal births, and conducting gynecological tests on unmarried women. Late-term abortion was also strictly forbidden. Women less than three months pregnant could undergo an abortion, 
but not those over three months. Multiple policies were issued, but in reality, we did see improper mandatory enforcement, which I wish had never happened. Certainly the stories, you know, that have, that have really flooded the West over that time, uh, about forced abortions, about the awful way in which the policy was implemented, you know, some of these still bring tears to my eyes when I read about them and when I have to try and speak about them. But as an economist, I can't move beyond the fact, or I always want to make the point, that slowing down population was a really good thing for China's per capita income. China's individual citizens would not be as wealthy today if the one-child policy had not been, been implemented. I think there were better ways that it could have been done. I think it created problems that, with the benefit of hindsight, we really should have recognised from the beginning. How to balance individual interests and collective interests, which is national development. This has been a central question, and this remains a central question. In China, an oriental country, we put greater emphasis on collective interests. State or collective interests may be placed slightly higher than individual interests. In terms of the family planning policy, when confronted with development issues, China chose to maximize the collective rather than individual interests. From the Western perspective, this is perhaps contentious, but for China, it was a choice to pursue the right to development. It's not about disrespecting human rights. It's that the right to development was given greater weight. Four decades ago, authorities were worried that people would have too many children and the exploding population would cause individual suffering as well as retard national development. But today, even with encouragement to reproduce, people are reluctant to have children. Such a scenario surprised scholars and policymakers. The sociocultural change has been sudden and sharp. If we could redo it, there are probably better choices. For example, we could have put more emphasis on providing better education for women and engaging them in the labor force. Also, we could have focused more on promoting economic and social development to raise people's income, which are crucial factors determining the fertility rate rather than simply rolling out birth control policies. Yes, I believe China will someday cancel the family planning policy. People will be free to determine the number of children they have and when they have them. However, after the limit was raised to two children per family in 2015, births declined again after a brief uptick. People may wonder why the fall because we had an accumulation of women aged 25 to 38 with only one child. After the policy was introduced, the second children were produced within a relatively concentrated period, which had an accumulative effect. Later, young people reflect fully on how many children they'd like to have. Today, even though people are permitted to have two children, they tend to have only one. Thus, although policymakers want to induce positive demographics, their removing strict birth limits seems to have made no difference. Fertility rates are still low, even still declining, and upheaval of the traditional family structure is increasing. For this reason, dropping the policy alone isn't enough to tackle our low fertility rate. Japan, the Republic of Korea, and Russia are sparing no efforts to encourage more birth, yet their fertility rates are far below the replacement level. That's why a more liberal policy is merely a necessary condition and far from enough. We must lessen the burden of bringing up children and raise people's awareness to have them. The trend of social development demands a higher fertility rate, which is more beneficial for a community or state. Thus, producing more children is not only an expression of a human right, but also consistent with the direction of social development in which individual and social interests are aligned. It seems clear that Chinese people soon will enjoy the right to determine on their own the number of children they have, because the country, in order to continue its historical development, must encourage people to have more children. But raising the fertility rate may be harder than limiting it. As I've already said, China has been effective in lowering the fertility rate. Now we're facing a problem of how to raise it. It's a more difficult task, since our policies will take time to bring results. It requires society to consistently foster family-friendly environments.
For instance, with access to inclusive free nursery schools and kindergartens for their children, parents wouldn't worry about investing so much effort in taking care of their babies. I think to boost the fertility rate, a relatively inexpensive measure for the government to adopt would be to offer accessible free nursery schools and kindergartens. Apart from that, we need to consider a package of measures for couples of reproductive age, including better treatment, improved income compensation, and longer maternity leave. In this sense, I think a family-friendly environment would help women who are willing to have children. This would ease people's worries regarding expense. On the other hand, as for those who aren't willing to have children, we must respect their choice. If people think the compensation and preferential policies can make up for the losses in this trade-off, they may decide to have children. If not, I think we can't criticize them for not having children. To be sure, China's fertility rates have dropped and the country's population growth has slowed. This irreversible trend is as clear as it is foreboding. China's population is aging rapidly. At present, 18% or nearly one-fifth of the Chinese population are above the age of 60. Many Western countries measure an aging society according to the percentage of people aged above 65, while China sets the line at 60. If the current growth rate continues, by 2050, 30% of Chinese, or 450 million people, will be over 60, which represents huge pressure. The US today is home to a mere 320 million people, more than 100 million fewer than just the elderly population of China by 2050. This represents one of the greatest challenges facing China down the road. As the elderly become an increasing percentage of China's population, there is greater vulnerability to illness and disease, which brings about higher care demands and cost burdens. The novel coronavirus epidemic spotlights this growing problem. Older people have more severe reactions with higher morbidity and mortality rates. It doesn't have to be catastrophic. There are lots of ways that you can go about addressing an aging population. No one wants to foot the bill for long-term care in an aging society, but China does. China's elderly care, child care, and domestic service industries will now enjoy a 10% deduction in tax A certified voice assistant lets customers access to telemedicine and for pay services. The Chinese government is investing in a major resource for the country's elderly, state-funded education. Dramatic growth in not only the number of pensioners, but also the years they have to be paid pension. China's absurdly low mandatory retirement. It's not a fallacy. Rethink. We need to rethink retirement. Retirement policy is a sensitive and hot topic in international society. I think delaying the retirement age is a critical measure for coping with China's aging society, shortage of labor, and inadequate pension funds. It's rational. We keep adding years to our lives and our perspective or definition of who's a senior should change accordingly. The definition of a senior that was set 100 years ago is no longer valid today. For example, a man in the agricultural society of the past was unable to work in the fields after the age of 50, when he was then considered old. But today, people over 70 could probably still work energetically and play a useful role. As such, it's wrong to define seniors according to one uniform standard. In this sense, later retirement in China is imperative, but must be a gradual process if social conflict is to be avoided. Later retirement would affect different groups of people differently. We've seen that people in different occupations respond differently to delaying their retirements. For people engaged in heavy physical labor, like the mining industry, later retirement means a major loss of benefits. So I think it's natural to hear different voices. The dissenting voices may diminish as China alters its economic structure. In other words, the number of laborers engaged in heavy manual work will keep falling and such industries will continue to disappear while the tertiary sector will continue to grow. Particularly after the fourth industrial revolution, more opportunities will be created for non-physical labor. Then the number of people within the range of impact will be reduced, so we'll face less resistance and the state will be more able to take care of that group of people through special policies. The direction has been set for gradually raising the retirement age. We'll adopt a step-by-step -step approach, a rise of two years over the next decade, that is 0.2 years annually. Today women in China retire at 55, 
which will be raised to 60, and 61 or 62 for men ultimately, but no doubt it will take a long time to realize this goal. Then take the pension system. It is the young who must support the old. A decreasing number of young workers and an increasing number of old retirees will put great pressure on society. Another problem with the pension system is that it's a bit like having meals from one big pot. People have access to a pension whether they have children or not, regardless of their contribution to the funding. People with more children, relatively speaking, contribute more to the overall pension system. They have devoted their time and energy to bringing up children who will support all the elderly in society. That's why I think our pension system needs reform to enable more compensation for more work done. That's to say we suggest collecting and providing a pension in a somewhat targeted manner. A percentage of the funds contributed by people would be distributed to their parents through official national accounts. In that case, people would be more motivated to have children and the population problem would be eased to a certain extent. Today, China's population is 1.4 billion. A billion people is a number um, that is shocking. The 1.4 billion Chinese people are enjoying a better life today than at any time in history. Can you say a large population is a burden? Do fewer people spell a better life? The 1.4 billion people are an asset for the whole country. 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion people. 1.4 billion Chinese. China's population number, 1.4 billion people, may seem massive, but still, China's population problem is real and relevant. <laughs> Looking broadly, China's past concerns about population explosion were legitimate, just as, ironically, China's current concerns about population contraction are also legitimate. A sustained fertility rate lower than the replacement level denotes demise, if gradual, of a community. It is simple logic. Data does not lie. China's demographic trends today will determine the kind of country that China will be tomorrow. Track China's population to be closer to China.